And thank you for joining us for our DC Plug Initiative Open House for Feeder 467. My name is Jam Kendrick and I represent the Community Outreach and Engagement Team. And we'd like to thank you tonight for joining us. Next slide. To begin, we will re review some basic controls to help you participate virtually on this platform. Please note this is an open meeting and as required by DC code 2-578, this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available to the public. The video file with both audio and video will be shared on DDOT's YouTube channel and that can be found at youtube.com slash DDOT videos. That'll be within seven days after the meeting has ended. This meeting is being live streamed to DDOT's Facebook page. That can be found at facebook.com slash DDOTDC. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not ask to speak. You may enter any questions or comments in the Q&A, which we will review in the next few slides. If you need technical support during this meeting, please call 202-997-8354. Using WebEx, audio and video, everyone is on mute. You cannot unmute yourself. We can unmute you during the Q&A and comment period. This helps ensure the meeting runs smoothly and there are no auditory disruptions during the presentation. To request to speak, you will need to use the raise hand feature, which we will cover very shortly. Everyone again is on mute and you cannot unmute yourself. Um, this helps us to ensure the meeting runs smoothly. We do have closed captions. WebEx has automatic system generated closed captions available during the meeting. Click the CC icon in the lower left corner of the window to turn on closed captions. There are additional settings, so you may adjust the appearance of your captions if needed. Using the WebEx mobile application, click the three dot icon, scroll down and select the closed caption option. This makes, just make sure to toggle switch is blue. If you're watching on video, your video camera is off by default and you will not be able to share your video. During the WebEx Q&A, if you do have a question during the presentation, send it via the Q&A feature. To send a question, click the three dot icon in the bottom right side of the WebEx window and select Q&A. A new panel or window will appear in the ask field, select all panelists. Collect the text box to type your questions and press the enter key to send it. If you joined by way of your browser or mobile app, click the Q&A or question mark icon to access the Q&A and to ask a question. If you dialed in by phone, dial star three, use the raised hand feet function, and this indicates to the project team that you would like to speak and ask a question. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to speak up about, please raise your hand. This indicates to the project team that you would like to speak. To virtually raise your hand, click the participants icon on the bottom right of the WebEx window, hover your cursor next to your name and click the raised hand icon. Alternatively, you may press the following keys on your keyboard. That's Control, Shift, and R. If you join by your browser or mobile app, click the three dot icon and select raise hand. If you dialed in by phone, dial star three to use the raise hand function. Tonight's agenda will flow as as you see listed. And for those who are listening, we'll start with the DC plug introductory video, the DC plug background, followed by existing systems model, the proposed underground system model, project status and timeline, project scope and limits, the maintenance of traffic, followed by, followed by communication strategy, and then our contact information. We'll watch a brief video now, and then I'll turn it over to Marcus.
The District of Columbia has experienced more violent storms in recent years, resulting in extensive power outages. For this reason, the district and PEPCO are working to reduce power outages by moving many of the overhead power lines underground to improve the infrastructure and enhance resiliency. Neighborhoods affected by construction will be notified well in advance of the project start date. This will include the posting of no parking signs. Construction will begin with the coordination of streets and sidewalks impacted in your neighborhood. Signs will be posted and flaggers will direct vehicles and pedestrians around construction crews. Before any digging begins, other existing utility lines that may be in the path of construction will be carefully identified and marked in the field. In some cases, small plants, trees, and grass will need to be removed from public spaces to allow for digging and placement of new underground equipment. But we will do our best to retain as much vegetation as possible. Any public property disturbed by this work will be restored to its original condition. Construction workers will use asphalt saws to cut the pavement. A backhoe will dig a trench for the placement of the distribution line. Periodically along the main primary line, manholes and tap holes will be required to house equipment and to provide access for instance and repairs. Echo will also be utilized to excavate for these structures. In order to meet jurisdictional safety requirements, shoring will be provided in the trench to ensure stability. PEPCO uses either fiberglass or plastic PVC conduit to protect underground power lines. Concrete will be poured into the trench to encase and secure the conduit, and steel plates will be placed over the trench temporarily to make the road usable to vehicle traffic. After the concrete is set, the steel plates will be removed and the trench will be repaved in sections. Transformers, switches, and other ancillary equipment will be set in place. Equipment such as transformers and switches will be installed either in the roadway or the sidewalk, depending on space availability. Underground cable will be installed. Landscaping will be restored as needed and roads paved. Overhead primary electric wires will be removed from poles, but secondary service and communication lines will remain. Finally, the new underground power lines will be energized. While electricity will remain on throughout the project, there will be a short scheduled outage needed to switch from the overhead lines to the new underground system. We appreciate your patience while the district and PEPCO improve the future of electrical service for the District of Columbia residents. Thank you and I'll turn it over to Marcus at this point. Thank you, JM. So I am Marcus Gill. I am a lead responsible engineer um, on the PEPCO side for this project. Um, so here's a little background um, on this program. So the DC Plug Initiative um, has a, a, a quite extensive history dating back to around 2012 uh, when Mayor Gray established the Mayor's Power Line Undergrounding Task Force following severe storms that caused days long outages for portions of the District of Columbia. The task force determined that improvements to the District of Columbia's electric distribution system to enhance its resiliency and reduce power outages caused by storms will require a new investment. PEPCO and the District Department of Transportation, DDOT, proposed what would become the DC Plugs Initiative in response to the findings of the task force. So in this slide, you can see um, the background, which I kind of talked about um, in a summary, as well as a budget. Um, so who is who is covering what um, and where the funds are coming from and we can go to the next slide. So this is what the overhead system looks right like right now in your area. Uh, a lot of the lines are overhead, uh, which can cause reliability issues for our customers. Uh, as you can see in the animation, a tree fell on that uh, power line up toward the the uh, northwest corner of the screen and as you can see that caused a power outage for every single house as well as the hospital um, so if you can see that is why we have started this program um, hopefully so we can underground those lines and not have this happen anymore next slide please 
So this is an example of the same tree falling down. And as you can see, there is no impact to anything um, really. But as you can see, there is another tree causing an outage down further um, onto a secondary line, and that only has three houses out. So undergrounding uh, the lines in this neighborhood will provide uh, greater reliability for most of our uh, most, if not all of our customers. And next, I will pass it over to James. Thank you, Marcus. So speaking of timeline for this project, feeder four six seven, this uh, focuses on the design. Currently, we're in uh, July with doing conducting the open house. What we show here is a typical schedule for a DC um, DDOT project, 30% design, 65%. Now, at this point, we do the open house. Um, in August, the designers will uh, submit their 100% final submission. And ultimately, in the, uh, later in, the, uh, in this fall, we will put the um, project out for construction, um, construction bid. Next slide. So civil construction timeline, um, once the contractor is on board and has been awarded the project uh, to start the construction, um, that will happen. Uh, our timeline is for that to begin in summer 2025. It should take about a year to complete. Um, following um, that activity, the installation of all the civil uh, components, um, the electrical construction will start, and that's primarily pulling lines, um, through the civil um, infrastructure um, and then ultimately energizing in the winter of 2027. Next slide. So for the project scope, this kind of touches on the activities related to um, civil and on into the electrical work. So first and foremost, the contractor is going to go out there and install uh, erosion and sediment control devices to protect existing trees and to prevent um, any runoff, um, uh, soil-laden runoff from getting into the uh, catch basins and on into the Anacostia um, and Potomac rivers. So the intention there, you'll see gutter buddies, for example, um, kind of blocking and filtering any water that's running into the curb inlets. Um, and as I mentioned, around the trees, there'll be um, some fencing to protect the trees. You'll also see um, MOT-related items like the cones in the street to protect um, uh, people coming by and knowing where the uh, construction work is happening. So right there, where we're looking at a picture on top, that's a trench that the contractor has cut and is currently laying conduit um, in that trench. Uh, following the installation of that conduit, they'll backfill with concrete. Um, that's the duct bank that will carry the electrical lines. Towards the picture below, that's one of the structures that um, would be installed that the duct bank is leading to. The final condition will be the picture on the bottom left uh, where everything has been kind of backfill restored. The only thing missing right there is a, a seed um, installed so that the grass uh, comes back. Um, so again, once all that work is in, everything will be restored back to the final condition um, where the grass again is restored, the roadway has been restored, any pavement markings will be provided as well. Next slide. So this is the area for a feeder 467. Um, it's primarily residential. Um, Nebraska, although it is residential, a little bit more of a thoroughfare a bit, um, and it does cross Connecticut Avenue. So we certainly recognize the challenges that these are narrow streets, a um, lot of cars parked along the side of the road um, in, these, uh, in these areas. Next slide. So that being the case, we do take maintenance of traffic very seriously. Uh, the intention will always be to provide advance notice 72 hours when the contractor will need to be in those areas um, to uh, they'll be putting up signs indicating that parking will be restricted. Um, again, advance notice There will be public outreach in advance of that as well. Um, letting folks know by flyers and such that um, we our contractors will be in the area. Um, there's always um, going to be um, safe accommodations for pedestrians. For example, if work is happening on one side of the sidewalk, you'll see advanced signage letting people know that the sidewalk is closed ahead and to use the opposite side of the road. Um, they certainly will be limited in terms of what we're allowed to do. The contractor is not allowed, for example, to block 
um, uh, this crosswalks um, in both directions, um, say at a corner. Um, so there are uh, uh, provisions in place to ensure that traffic is allowed to still continue. It will be um, impacted because we certainly need to do this work and we cannot have um, pedestrians or vehicles or even bicyclists in those areas. But again, we'll coordinate and communicate um, the needs as far in advance as possible. Excellent. So, uh, speaking of maintenance of traffic, this is typical condition. So, the top image there kind of shows that we'll have traffic drums to kind of separate the area where cars and um, bikes will be from some of the work um, on either side, essentially, uh, is a typical condition um, to try to maintain uh, flow of traffic. And certainly in this area, we don't necessarily have separate bike lanes. So bikes and cars will still travel in um, in the same area. Instances where we're limited down to one lane, uh, we might, there may be times um, that the contractor will have to um, do that. He'll utilize flaggers to coordinate traffic and um, ensure safe passage. And here's a similar situation where the a situation where the contractor may be working in the middle of the roadway. Um, and traffic will still be maintained in either direction. But again, there will be intermittent situations where the contractor will have to um, come out of the uh, work zone and over to the side of the road. Um, so there'll be intermittent um, moments where there'll be a flagger or someone letting people know to um, stop and um, prevent uh, any kind of incidents. Here again is another typical condition that you'll see where we're more working on the side of the road near the sidewalk um, and traffic is still allowed to pass um, in either direction. Pass it to uh, Raisha. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. My name is Raisha Quarry. I am with the DC Flood Communications team. Um, my team and I provide outreach and engagement um, for the DC plug program, and we do that by implementing the um, DC plug education plan. Right now we're in the design phase, so we don't start the education plan yet, but we do do a good amount of outreach. So, so far we've already met with um, the Mokers, the mayor's office, the council member's office, and C's been presented to. And right now we're hosting you guys for our virtual open house that we do in the design phase. And then up next, um, some of you all will receive um, packets from our uh, community outreach coordinators who will be um, giving you packets because your home is near a transformer enclosure. The transformer enclosure will be installed in the public space, but as a courtesy, we'd like to let everyone know when, if your house is nearby. Um, after that, we will end out the design phase with a one pager, just summarizing everything that we're saying here, as well as an estimated time of start for construction. Once we begin to um, implement the education plan, it's around the pre-construction phase. So we do, we always do a 30-day notification, a 15-day notification, and a 15-day no, notification and a seven-day notification, door-to-door. Um, -to, -door. to all residents that will be impacted by the project, you guys will receive a door hanger um, three times, at least three times. We also host a pre-construction meeting. Um, we will invite everyone who attended today as well as um, go door to door with that information as well. So we'll have a pre-construction meeting to let you know what to expect during construction. Uh, we do resident letters as needed. Um, those residents who maybe just like James said, a sidewalk is gonna be closed. We'd like to give you guys a heads up. So we give out letters for that, for those impacted residents as well as um, we do the TE letters. So those same residents who got the TE packets during the design phase, they'll get letters and packets again during the construction phase, just to remind them and just in case people were moved and such. Um, we also schedule, um, we also distribute the schedule regularly. So as we get the schedules from the contractors, we, we give that to the community. They are also posted on our website. And we um, also have our traffic advisories posted as well, and we distribute those as well to the community. We attend the ANCs regularly, um, just to give an announcement to let you know that we're there, give you an update, um, send out the schedule that way, and hear any questions that we can cover there. And then we, we do that via your dedicated outreach team who will 
be doing this all for you guys. Um, we also have a 24-hour hotline. Um, a few of you have already called. The number is 844-758-4146. If you guys have any questions, feel free to call that number. Um, and then we also have an email at questions at dcpluginfo.com. So in the electrical phase, is a lot less impactful. Um, rarely get a whole bunch of um, engagement during that phase. However, we still have our 24 hour hotline available and we do do outreach to, to the residents st still by still attending the ANCs regularly. We give you 72 hours in advance and you guys will get those letters um, distributed to you door to door on your doorknobs. And then we do phone calls as well, just to follow up as well. As long as you're not on the no call list, then we will call you about it too. At the bottom of the page, you'll see that there is some sample collateral. So you can look forward to seeing these types of things. They should look similar to the invitation that got you here tonight. And yeah, that's all we have for engagement. We can pass it over to Peyton. Good afternoon or evening, everybody. Um, my name is Peyton Manning. I'm one of the outreach coordinators during the design phase of this project. I uh, just wanted to thank you all for joining tonight. And we're about to get ready for the Q&A. I see a few of you have sent some questions in either the chat or the Q&A box. Either is fine. Uh, we'll do our best to capture them in the order received. If you want to talk on the phone, you can raise your hand on the uh, on the WebEx platform. Or if you called in, you can press star three to raise your hand. Um, but before we jump into the questions, I did want to point out the Title VI survey. For those of you who are on your uh, either app or, or computer, you'll be automatically redirected after the meeting to take the survey. Um, it takes about a minute or two. It's just really helpful for us to better understand how best to serve you uh, holding these meetings in your community. Um, we'd really appreciate if you would take the time to give us the feedback. If you called in, you can access the survey from tinyurl.com slash title vi dash survey um so again it's tinyurl.com slash title vi dash survey again if you wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes to take that it would really help us um especially as we hold those meetings that Rachel was mentioning going forward um but now we're jumping into the q a so i did want to Go ahead and tackle the first question I saw come through from uh, Alan. Alan said, water and sewer lines run to houses from water mains in the center of the street. What kind would be above or below those lines? I can take that. Um, generally, they'll be below, um, but it certainly just depends on the depth of those lines. Um, typically, sanitary lines may be relatively deep. Um, so. And in water lines, service lines are uh, say four and a half feet or so below grade. So we typically would be below the, the water lateral and in some cases above the sewer lateral. Thank you, James. Um, and then I have a question. Will work occur only during the daytime or will overnight off hours work occur? The intention is that they will occur during the day. Um, if the schedule, we run into scheduling issues or other issues that require us to accelerate the schedule. There may be off peak hours um, uh, work, but that is not the intention. And then all off work in Saturday, off peak in Saturday uh, work has to be approved by DDOT, right, James? Correct. Okay. Um, and then I have, uh, can we please review the timeline from earlier in the presentation? Yes, I will shoot back to that. And then right after that, uh, Bill Gordon, I see you have your, ra your hand raised, so I will jump back to you. Um, so, Robert, the schedule right now, we're anticipating construction to start summer 2025. It's about a 12 month project, so you should see civil construction finishing uh, by summer 2026. Civil being putting the structures and the conduit below ground. Once that's completed, the PEPCO team will come back out and they'll be working within the manholes to pull the wire. Um, and then they're during the electrical phase and then the once that's completed, um, the power lines underground, it will be energized and then about a month or two after you'll start seeing the uh, lines, existing lines coming down and the poles being shortened, but most of the poles will remain. Um, Bill, I see that your hands raised. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. I, I believe you have to accept the request. And then we should be able to hear you. Uh, 
Um, uh, my name is Bill Gordon. I live on Livingston Street uh, in the midst of this project. Um, my my question to you is: How will the power lines get from the underground conduit uh, to the electric meter on the side of the house? And assuming uh, they go up the pole, the existing poles, and then come across, uh, you know, the yard to the to the side of the house. Uh, those wires would still be vulnerable to falling trees. I mean, obviously, we just put my house out of a commission and not the whole neighborhood, which is the reason for the undergrounding of the feeder lines. But uh, so I'm just curious about how that would work. And also, is there a possibility that as this construction progresses, individual homeowners can elect to underground to their homes at their own uh, you know, cost, of course? Yeah, I could speak to that. So you're correct. The program is focused on um, the major feeders. The, so there's, there's primary and secondary distribution. The secondary is once the power has been stepped down and it goes to each individual home. The primary lines are what's shown in the um, essentially in the blue. So by essentially, if we equate it to say a roadway, a highway is that major thoroughfare. If you if you block off the highway. None, no one can get to any of the neighborhoods. And that is the goal is to try to prevent, um, you know, that major trunk um, from being impacted. And to your point, you're correct. If a, if a tree goes down and it goes down on the line in front of your house, the intention is that it limits it to just those few um, lines that are connected to that specific um, transformer or those secondary lines. So it's the secondary lines that is not part of the program. Um, so once the power, so to answer your first question in terms of how the power gets to the meter, so from the substation that those lines will be um, the primary line will be undergrounded. When we get to closer to the homes, um, spread out throughout the neighborhood, there are transformers that will be in the ground. Um, those transformers step the power down to the secondary level, what is safe for the homes. That line will go back up the pole and connect to the existing secondary lines that run along the poles now. So that's why the poles will still remain. The lines coming from the poles to your homes will still remain, unless you have it already underground it. It will, that will again also still remain, but um, yeah, it's not part of the program to underground any secondary services. Okay, will we be able to, I mean, do let's assume mine is not underground at the moment and I wanna hire a you know, contractor to come unground it uh, can I coordinate it at the same time or is, or will there be provisions in the infrastructure to tap in at a later date? Um, it certainly can be done it, but it's not part of the program and it won't be related to the program because it wouldn't be our contractor per se. So if you were able to work something out with PECO to get that work done, because you have a contract or you work something out with PECO, it would be separate from what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No problem. And I wanted to go back to one thing. I think Linda Combs' question, you answered the first part about the poles will not be removed. The street trees will also, they should not be affected. There may need to be some trimming just to get some of the work done. But other than that, uh, generally the street trees will remain there. I don't recall specifically on this project, but there's a lot of utilities underground. And in some instances, we have to um, do work um, in behind the sidewalk with some of the manholes that may impact certain trees. Anything smaller than say an eight inch is, but has the potential of being impacted, but we did try to avoid any impacts on any trees. Great, thank you, James. Um, and I, I think you answered the question from Adam about power lines to any houses being uh, underground. Uh, all the work happening on this project is, is in the public space. So Correct. what he was saying earlier, uh, it will not, um, and then we have a gas powered generator or we no longer need this. Yeah, this is separate from gas. So if you have gas, gas will still remain out there as, um, as an option. Um, certain that's, that's an individual choice if you want to switch from gas to electric, but this shouldn't, um, it's not going to change your service. You cut out a little bit, James, but um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just saying it wasn't going to change your service as far as yeah. gas or electric. Perfect. 
and and it should increase the reliability. You shouldn't see as many outages. Um, so the need for the generator, you may find you don't really need it, um, but certainly something could fall on the secondary lines. Um, is feeder 467 the same as now? Does the 467 feeder connect to reliable Connecticut Avenue underground feeder? Uh, I think that's a Pepco question. Yes, um, I can answer that. Um, so Connecticut Avenue actually has feeder of 467 already um, as well as 476 that are both already underground uh, so that it will be connected to that as well through a, a four-way switch great 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 um and then where will the transformers be located um i don't know if you can speak to that at this time james i know we're still working through the design um but typically i think it's Kind of follows the overhead. Uh, if you look up and see a transformer, you, there may yeah. be one pretty close to to that location. Right. If um, you see those kind of gray buckets um, type of things, they they look like gray buckets, but they're transformers. Generally, you'll see if you maybe you could flip back to the image images that we had in the sidewalk. Um, mm -hmm. Right. You'll see something along the lines of what's what's shown here. Um, in the sidewalk, um, but somewhere in the in the vicinity of where there's existing transformers. Um, and then Nebraska Avenue is concrete. Will the street be restored as concrete or replaced with asphalt overlay? As concrete. Great, great, great. All right now, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, Bill, your hand was raised. Oh, okay. Thank you for raising it again. I was. I was going to say I have lowered it. Um, we should be able to hear you now. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. Will these lines be upgraded from the current lines? So if, uh, you know, a number of people in the neighborhood or on the block want to switch from uh, gas to electric heat or whatever, they, the, you have enough capacity to do that or people want to, you know, do heavy ups, uh, you, you know, in, in, in mass would the new line be able to handle that? I would say, yeah, I would say it's fine. I mean, the, I leave that. Let's let Pep go answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you, we should be able to to handle that capacity if you ever wanted to upgrade your appliances from gas to electric. I'm not going to say yeah, update, it, uh, convert. Yeah, it will be the uh, capacity available on a, on a Pepco side, but you need to make sure there's enough capacity on your secondary side of the feeder. Upgrade that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bill. Bill, I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand. Oh, you did it for me. <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to raise it again. Um, and then Linda asked, "Are the transformers poles? Are the transformers on poles in the alley as well?" Um, I think I've seen them there. I don't recall on this program whether or not we are um, going to any poles in the alley. Typically. This project and, and all of the DC flood program is intended to remain in the public right of way. Um, and if a pole is in the alley, a lot of times it's um, in private property. Um, and if that's the case, typically we try to avoid um, going to those poles. But I, I just apologize. I just don't recall off the top of my head if we have any specifically in the alley on this program, on this project. I can second that, James. I don't believe there are any at all in, in alleys for this feeder. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to give it another moment or two to see if any more questions come through. Again, if you have any questions, you can send them in the chat or the Q&A, or you can raise your hand. Bill, I got you. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And then also, if you have any questions and want to speak, if you're on the phone, you can press star three, or you can raise your hand. Um, Bill should be able to get you now. Uh, yeah, I got the, always seems a new question pops into my mind. So <laughs> you mentioned that you know, you've got the underlaw the wires in the, uh, in the uh, trenches running down the street and those wires are going to somehow get to the pole and go up the pole to where our current, uh, you know, uh, secondary wires feed our homes. I presume that you're going to put some kind of conduit on the side of the poles as they, as those wires go up. 
you know, for safety purposes? Are they going to be big and ugly or are they going to, you know, sort of meld in with the current poles? They typically have a, like kind of a shield. If you see some poles, uh, even, um, well, it's, it's different for Verizon or whatever, but there typically is a, a protector or a, a, some sort of shield, I'll say a metal shield that protects the line as it runs up the pole. Okay. Okay. All right. It will match to the pole color most of the time. Say that again, please. It will matching with the pole. So you won't see the difference on a pole, but you will just see the big, small bump on a pole. Okay. That protects okay. the cables. Yeah. The brown shield going up the side. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if you have any more questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand. Uh, RGM, I'm going to go ahead and request to unmute you as well. Uh, you just have to accept on your end. We should be able to hear you now. Yep, we got you. Okay, great. Uh, so, I, I don't know if you can answer this now, but the construction, so you your timeline shows about a year. Does that mean, like, the street is going to be open with steel plates pretty much for 365 days or will it be like, you know, sort of block by block and then restoring it as you go? A, a little bit of both. I mean, it won't be certainly the entire area won't be opened up with steel plates. The, the way the construction typically happens. Um, the contractor will come in, um, open up a rectangular area, say in the road, and install a manhole structure. They'll do temporary pavement um, in those areas as they go along. Um, they are limited in how much area they can leave in terms of temporary pave. They'll have to come back and do some restoration, but then they'll also do the conduit work. So, speaking in linear feet, there's a, you know, a few thousand feet that they can go before they have to do a permanent restoration. So it won't be that there are steel plates and then permanent restoration. There'll be steel plates, then temporary asphalt pavement, which be maybe a little bit bumpy. It's not perfect, um, but then ultimately, but long before they move on to other areas, they'll have to do a permanent restoration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a hand raised from Jim McCarthy. I'm going to go ahead and request to unmute you. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm on the 3800 block of Livingston, and um, over the years, uh, uh, I think because we have had this feeder line, um, there's been a lot of uh, tree work done, um, you know, on our block and on other blocks on Livingston. It seemed like for a while, every two or three years, um, Pepco or its contractor would come out and uh, make the trees V-shaped. And I'm wondering if, uh, with these feeder, with the feeder line going underground, whether there will be any um, change in the schedule for tree work, um, uh, maybe a lessening so that the trees could look a little bit more normal. That's a Pepco question. Yeah, I would pass that to Pepco. Uh, yeah. an answer for that. Okay. Hey, Jim, this is uh, from Pepco. Uh, uh, that part of the feeder we undergrounding, then it's going to be a normal tree after that because there's no feeder going on unless there's uh, any overhead feeder going to the customer house that need to be protected. They then they cut the based on that information, but uh, on required by the Pepco. So most likely if it's undergrounding that portion, it will be going to the normal configuration after that. Also, for okay, the thanks. most part, uh, maintenance trimming is also done every two years. And certainly because the, the lines that we're undergrounding on, on a pole, typically you'll have the um, secondary lines and then the primary lines are much further up. So we're dealing with the lines that are further up. So those secondary lines still being there, um, you'll still see the trimming, um, but I don't know how much that undergrounding will impact uh, the schedule for the maintenance of the trees. A normal pepper schedule is every two years. 
But it doesn't, once it's undergrounded, that schedule doesn't change. The, once the primaries are undergrounded, the schedule doesn't change. It's a depend on the secondary on a line. And if it's that secondary is so close to the tree, then we will keep them, maintain that schedule to protect the secondary going to the customer's house. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Uh, Jim, does that answer your question or do you have anything yeah, else? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to mute you and lower your hand. If you have anything else, please just feel free to raise it again. I do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, one being that we have an alley pole with a light only and some cable services from Livingston to the alley. Um, not sure how to supply power to the light. Um, Ronald, is the light currently not working or, and perhaps Pepco may have some more information on that or understand it, but we may need some clarity from you. Oh, it's fine and it works. Um, so that should remain. Um, it's being fed. Uh, it's essentially think of it as a secondary line as opposed to a primary. If there's no transformer on it as well, if there were a transformer um, that either is a different um, feeder or it, it was decided not to um, replace that particular transformer. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, Rana, that doesn't answer your question. Let me know and double back. I um, have a question from Robert. Uh, DC Water is currently replacing lead feeder pipes to the homes. Uh, will that be coordinated with this project? Yes, we we meet with them regularly and coordinate in terms of ensuring that um, we are not in their way and they are certainly not in ours. Um, and they also have participated or attended um, some of our construction work to observe. Um, where we are uh, happen to uncover um, some of the lines and it gives them opportunity to, to take a look and see where these um, lead lines are and confirm what they have on record. Great, great, great. And I also, I think a lot of that work is happening in the uh, private space. So they'll be working outside of our, our, our work. Again, I'm not seeing anything else. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to send them in the chat uh, or the Q&A box or raise your hand. Uh, if you're calling in, you can press star three or you can use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen. Um, while I wait for a few questions, I just want to go over the project website and the email. Um, you should have all of this. It should all be on the flyer you received to join this meeting. Um, but certainly, if you want to follow the project, um, you can go to the project website, www dcpluginfo.com. Once you're there, you can go to Ward 3 and select your feeder. Um, there you'll find this presentation will be posted in about the next 72 hours or so. Um, you can sign up for the listserv to uh, stay abreast of any information as it comes out and we start getting into the pre-construction phase. Um, if you have any questions specifically at this time, you can reach out to uh, questions at dcpluginfo.com or you can call the 24 hour hotline 1-844-758-4146. Again, I'll give it another moment to see if any more questions come through, but I do wanna thank you all for coming out tonight um, and joining us. And again, please, if you don't mind taking that survey at the end of this meeting, um, it'll really help us going forward as we hold these meetings, uh, getting into the pre-construction phase. Hey, Peyton, I just wanna make sure we didn't miss this question from uh, Ronald Kahn. Um, if feeder 467, it, the same as now, does the 467 feeder connect to reliable Connecticut Ave underground feeder? Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. oh, we covered that. Yeah, we covered that. Uh, I think Marcus had mentioned that it will tie in, uh, to the Connecticut Avenue, uh, infrastructure. Great. Just, just double checking to make sure we don't have any questions. Uh, I'm not seeing any more come through again. Oh. Uh, dcpluginfo.com to follow the project. Questions at dcpluginfo.com is the email. If you would like to send any questions following the meeting at any time, please feel free to reach out. I really appreciate you all for joining. Uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Jignesh Marcus.